India is in the throes of one of the darkest moments in the nation's history. A deadly pandemic is now sweeping through a country at an immense speed. Thousands are dying every day as infections continue to soar to record levels. All of a sudden, an overwhelming sense of optimism has now turned into despair and anguish. My wife went away, my two brothers-in-law went away, and my mother-in-law expired. India is staring at a human catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. What's gone wrong? How could the nation that seemed to have overcome the first COVID wave last year is now down on its knees? Death, devastation, desperation, and despair has permeated the lives of 1.3 billion people in India as the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic hit the country with immense ferocity. Around 400,000 new cases and more than 4,000 deaths have been reported on many days in May. India's healthcare system has buckled under pressure, leaving people without life-saving hospital beds, oxygen and drugs. In all, over 290,000 people have died from the virus, with reported infections topping 26 million. Why did a country that seemed to have kept a relatively tight lid on the pandemic is now struggling to keep the virus at bay? When the pandemic first took hold last year, India took swift and drastic actions. It even imposed one of the most aggressive lockdowns the world had ever seen. We were early in declaring a lockdown that of course had its own repercussions on migrant workers and others. But in terms of the numbers, that certainly had an impact. Uh, the numbers came down and uh, you know, a lot of people thought that it's over. And by the middle of January this year, it seemed India had beaten back the viral onslaught. The infection numbers were around 15,000 a day and the deaths fell to about 175. From last October, most safety protocols had been abandoned and millions travelled between states forgetting what happened earlier in 2020. In late September, when Diwali came around in October, people thought that we had gotten over the pandemic and they kind of relaxed completely and started congregating at Diwali time, at uh, then wedding started, large wedding gradually became larger, people going started going to malls and you know, that kind of stuff happened. Little did they realize that a new and a more virulent coronavirus variant had emerged. There is an extremely uh, different variant is now spreading in our country because already we know South African variant and this uh, Brazilian variants are extremely resistant and it, uh, it infects even the lower age group that is all in rubber. So we have those Plus, we have our own, uh, you know, there is an Indian variant because this virus is highly variable. You know, it adapts pretty fast. We did not expect this new viral strain to be so transmissible. This current viral strain is spreading so fast that we've seen that even one percent, one person in the family is infected. The entire household comes down with the infection in the next 10 or 12 days. Uh, we published the first book on uh, COVID-19, the first book in the world, in fact, in uh, February of 2020. And in that, uh, we warned of a second wave. We warned of mutations. Uh, you know, at that time, when we started writing the book, there were no cases in India. 
And over the last 14 months, we have repeatedly, and when I say we, it's not just me, there are other scientists around the country, have uh, repeatedly warned of an impending second wave. But the warnings went unheeded. The viral floodgates are now wide open. With hundreds of thousands of infections each day, thousands are dying daily. The dead include victims from all sections of the society, political leaders, film stars, national players, ordinary citizens, poor people, and even doctors, nurses, health workers, and journalists. Even the national capital, Delhi, is witness to horrifying scenes of people dying on the way to hospitals, deprived of medical care and oxygen. The entire situation in Delhi is something that we probably only saw in movies. It, it seem, seems like an apocalypse where everything around just seems to be crumbling down. You know, the scenes are horrendous. If you see the visuals from Delhi, from the hospitals, you know, people walking in with their own oxygen cylinders, people gasping for breath. The numbers uh, don't tell enough of a story, but still they speak loud and clear. So we have 21 million documented infections in India and over 200,000 documented death. The initial onslaught took place in the western state of Maharashtra and Delhi. Even Pune, known as a science and vaccine hub, was laid low by the viciousness of the disease. 47-year-old Arun Gaikwad, an Air Force officer, was defenseless against the invisible aggressor. Gaikwad's heart-wrenching story portrays the depth and magnitude of the unprecedented tragedy. It all started with an innocuous puja, or Hindu ritual performed for Gaikwad's father-in-law, who died in January following a stroke. In the first month, it was fine, there was no problem. सेकंड मंथ में मार्च में जब इकट्ठा हुए थे 14 मार्च को सभी लोग जो है घर के ही लोग थे उस समय जो है मेरा जो छोटा साला है उनकी तबीयत थोड़ी सी खराब थी मतलब उनको सर्दी जुकाम हुआ था तो उसके कारण उनके ध्यान में नहीं आया। The next day, all hell broke loose. 38-year-old Rohit Jadav started having some breathing difficulties. He was rushed to a nearby hospital and other family members were tested. Usko hospitalized karne ke baad mein, do din baad usko Baner Covid Center jo hai, waha par le jaya gaya. Aur waha le jane ke baad, uska jo condition hai, wo critical ho gaya. Usko ICU mein bharti karna pada. To jaysay wo ICU mein bharti karne ke baad mein, ghar ke jo log hai, unho ne test kara liya apna. The test reports of all family members, including Gagwad's 14-year-old son and 18-year-old daughter, were positive. My mother-in-law was Alka Jadho, then my brother-in-law was Atul Jadho, then his daughter was Rutuja Jadho, and my daughter also, Sushmita. The four people got the report positive. I tested my son and my son, Prajwal. He tested both of them. He got Prajwal positive. और मेरा नेगेटिव आया टेस्ट और उसके बाद में मेरा टेस्ट होने के बाद मेरे वाइफ का और मेरी मदर का दोनों का टेस्ट किया हमने वो टेस्ट भी पॉजिटिव पाया गया उसके बाद 28 मार्च को मेरी वाइफ जो है वैशाली उसको ब्रीथिंग प्रॉब्लम शुरू हुआ विद वैशाली फॉलिंग सिक द नाइट में फॉर द केकवाट फैमिली इंटेंसिफाइड for hours, Gekwad rushed from one hospital to another, but none opened its doors and took the gasping woman in. Gekwad found a cardiac ambulance, but the oxygen supply in the van was running low. Katraj Karke place, I took them to hospital. After going there, they had a lot of breathing problems and the oxygen level was low. तो उन्होंने कहा कि इनको वेंटिलेटर बेड की जरूरत है। तो उन्होंने कहा कि हमारे पास कोई सुविधा नहीं है, आप इनको ले जाइए और कहीं दूसरी जगह ले जाइए। तो मैंने काफी रिक्वेस्ट किया उनको, 
बट दे आर दे वॉज अनेबल टू उसके लिए कोई वो आ, नहीं ट्रीट कर रहे थे वहाँ से मैंने एक घंटे बाद लगभग दो ढाई बजे उनको वहाँ से लेके पुणे में जम्बो कोविड हॉस्पिटल बनाया है शिवाजी नगर में वहाँ ले गया उनको वहाँ ले गया तो वहाँ पर जो है वो उसका डोर गेट जो है वो बंद था बिल्कुल मतलब उन्होंने खोला ही नहीं गेट ही नहीं खोला उसको और मैंने काफ़ी उनको रिक्वेस्ट की और मैं रिक्वेस्ट करता रहा लेकिन उन्होंने गेट खोला नहीं ना ही डॉक्टर कोई देखने आया उसके बाद जो है अराउंड और एक घंटे बाद The same story of hospital apathy and helplessness was repeated ad nauseum as Gaekwad with his dying wife sped from one hospital to another frantically knocking on doors but no help came oxygen was running low the ambulance driver suggested a hospital far away from the city to mera driver tha unhone ek number diya ek doctor यहाँ से दूर खेड़ शिवापुर करके प्लेस है अराउंड 40 किलोमीटर होगा तो वो डॉक्टर से मैंने बात की तो उन्होंने कहा कि उनके पास एक वेंटिलेटर बेड अवेलेबल है उन्होंने उनको आईसीयू में ले लिया देन ऑक्सीजन लगाया और एनआईवी सिस्टम जो होता है एनआईवी पे उनको रखा गया वेंटिलेटर शुरू कर दिया गया एंड शी वॉज कॉन्शियस वो बात कर रही थी और उनका ऑक्सीजन लेवल भी मतलब तब तक पहले तो लो हो गया था लेकिन जब वहाँ जाने के बाद लगभग एक दो घंटे बाद वो 90 अबो था मतलब को उनको एडमिट किया 28 को तो मैं शाम को निकल आया वापस 30 तारीख को सुबह जब पूछा था तो उन्होंने कहा था ठीक है उनकी तबीयत अभी सैचुरेशन भी ठीक है ऑक्सीजन लेवल ठीक है लेकिन जब इवनिंग में सडनली उन्होंने कहा कि ऑक्सीजन लेवल उनकी लो हो गई है सैचुरेशन ठीक से नहीं हो रहा है उसके बाद ही उन्होंने कहा कि कार्डियक अरेस्ट आया तो हम उसमें कुछ नहीं कर सके बचा नहीं पाए उनको बट दिस वॉज एन इनफ ट्रेजिडी फॉर गेकवाड इन जस्ट फिफ्टीन डेज इन एप्रिल हाफ ऑफ अरुण एंड वैशालीज फैमिली वॉज वाइप आउट थर्टी एथ को मेरी वाइफ एक्सपायर्ड हो गई ऑन थर्ड अप्रिल मेरा जो ब्रदर इन लॉ है रोहित जाधव ये थर्टी एट ईयर्स ओल्ड वो एक्सपायर्ड हुआ तीन अप्रैल के बाद चार अप्रैल को जो है मेरी मदर इन लॉ एक्सपायर्ड हो गई अलका जाधव शी वॉज सिक्सटी टू और उसके बाद जो है चौदह अप्रैल को अतुल जाधव फोर्टी ईयर्स ओल्ड वो एक्सपायर्ड हो गए सर What has happened to Arun is being played out in a drawn out macabre sequence throughout the country. No hospital beds, no oxygen cylinders, no medicine. People sitting on the pavements with bodies of loved ones. How did it come to such a pass? At the end of last year, when the infection and death numbers began to fall, fatal miscalculations were made. The government believed the worst was over. Some scientists believed a herd immunity had developed. Tens of thousands of farmers held rallies for months. Millions gathered to perform religious rites known as Kumbha Mela. One of the confounding factors in the second wave has been uh, large gatherings, whether it is for the Kumbha Mela, a religious gathering, all the political rallies uh, which occurred uh, throughout uh, west bengal and uh, these have undoubtedly contributed to the amplitude of the second wave uh, the bengal situation is yet to manifest fully because we should keep in mind that there is a 2 to 3 week interval between uh, the infection the clinical features of the infection and uh, one acquiring it and political leaders including prime minister narendra modi joined the bandwagon holding mammoth election rallies modi's image now lies in tatters since he squandered early successes in the battle against the virus as prime minister modi is now saddled with the largest share of the blame for the unprecedented catastrophe His critics believe he could have made more vigorous attempts to check the spread of the virus. One worrying factor is reports that have appeared in the media. I haven't personally confirmed that that at the highest level 
the COVID task force uh, did not meet for two months. I find it hard to believe, but if that is indeed true, that between uh, January and March for two whole months, the national COVID task force uh, did not meet even once, I would assume that means that uh, they were complacent. Still, most experts agree that it was a collective failure of all concerned, including the Modi government, assuming that herd immunity has been attained. Based on a very incorrect estimate that India had possibly acquired herd immunity, various antibody surveys were done in a piecemeal patchy fashion across the country, which of course showed very markedly varying results, but the best results showing a very widespread antibody positivity were relied upon to believe that most of India, if not all of the country, had acquired herd immunity. Of course, the public wanted to believe it. The businessmen wanted to believe it because they wanted to put the economy back on rails. The small trader wanted to believe it because they had suffered a lot. And the politicians wanted to believe it because they wanted to go back to election rallies. Even people who wanted to organize religious festivals wanted to believe that good news because that was their business as well. It was a collective blame that the people relaxed. We, we started going back to work. There was airlines. So it was collective between the people and the government that we thought that we had gotten over it. And we got a rude shock. Failing to anticipate the impending disaster, India is now staring at a dark abyss. The healthcare infrastructure has collapsed. A desperate government led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi appears clueless and directionless as it is being severely criticised at home and abroad. How soon can India breathe again? When will this nightmare end? virus does not recognize borders or political spheres. Neither does it have respect for religions or social status. All it needs is human hosts to multiply and spread. And Indian political and religious leaders provided the killer virus with millions of welcoming hosts. As the election season heated up in four states and one union territory, all caution was thrown to the winds. Common people are now paying the price for the failure of the leadership and the administration. The grim tragedy has also become a tragic equalizer in a class and caste-ridden society. Even the privileged in Delhi cannot get a single hospital bed to take care of their near and dear ones. Archana Datta is the former chief of both Dordashan and All India Radio, India's national broadcasters. When Archana's husband and mother fell ill last month, they couldn't access any medical treatment. Archana's son, Abhishek recalls the night of horror that the family went through trying to get medical attention for his father and grandmother. I started taking my father downstairs. He lost consciousness um, while he was going, uh, while we were trying to take him to the car. And then without waiting for a confirmation, we just rushed to the emergencies of nearby private hospitals. So Max Sake happens to to be the nearest hospital from my house, we immediately took him to the COVID emergency there, found that there was simply no protocol to receive critical patients. In between, we had tried ambulances, a couple of numbers again. Some numbers don't exist, some numbers are just perennially busy, um, and we couldn't lose that kind of time. At the driveway of the emergency, after quite a bit of calling people, a person with an oximeter came and said, okay, the pulse is really weak, but we are at capacity, we don't have oxygen, 
you need to take him somewhere else. And I asked him, where else does one go? And he had no idea. He said, just take him somewhere else. We can't do anything. Eventually, uh, my driver figured that there's a public hospital here that we could take him to the Malvia Nagar, Madan Mohan Malvia Hospital in Malvia Nagar. We took him there. Uh, the, the doctors did. I mean, so once we put him in the stretcher, rushed him to the ER room, the doctors did have a look. And then that's when they declared him brought dead. After his father's death, the attention turned to his grandmother, whose condition was also worsening at home. Despite the family and scores of their friends trying their level best, they could not find a single hospital where they could shift the elderly lady. On the night of April 27, in the span of only a few hours, Abhishek lost both his father and grandmother. I was in a car with a friend. Uh, my sister was uh, holding my grandmother in the car, in another car and following us. But midway, um, so we had barely left for 10 minutes and we realized my grandmother was not going to make it because she lost consciousness. We decided to rush her to the same public hospital in Malvianaga where my father was declared dead mere hours earlier. And unfortunately, we took her there and um, they pronounced her brought dead as well. 32-year-old Abhishek, a PhD scholar at Oxford University, knows all too well that the family's privileged status could not save his father and grandmother. He's now holed up in his Delhi home, where other members are also infected. But he can't take them to a hospital, since he believes, if you step out, you will die. Families like mine are now beginning to realize that um, our lack of a solid healthcare infrastructure is something that can devastate anyone and uh, doesn't discriminate between, you know, the powerful and the powerless. Uh, and so it just, this is just a reminder of how bad our healthcare has been and how we've sort of neglected it because we felt that, you know, our networks, our connections, our privileges are going to protect us. And the COVID has been the great equalizer in that. If you step out right now, you step out to die either from the disease or from the real threat of destitution, uh, from the collapse of the economy that's also happening and killing lives. Just as in Delhi, so in Lucknow, the capital of India's most populous state with 200 million people, the situation is dire. Funeral pyres are burning relentlessly with the state recording more than 1.6 million infections so far, and around 50% of its death toll of 18,500 was recorded over the last two months. 43-year-old banker Anko Agnihotri received a call from his mother on April 20th. He rushed to Lucknow from Delhi and found his father, Mahendra Agnihotri, a former government official, gasping for breath. As Anko moved heaven and earth to secure medical care for his father, he met with the same callousness, apathy and helplessness that's now being seen across the nation. जो हॉस्पिटल की बात हुई कि अंकल ने उन्होंने नंबर भेज दिए थे जो डिस्ट्रिक्ट हॉस्पिटल न्यूज़पेपर में ऐड आए थे विद द नोडल ऑफिसर्स के साथ में तो उस पे फिर मैं सब पे कॉल करता रहा किसी ने कोई नॉट रीचेबल किसी का स्विच ऑफ किसी का नंबर नहीं मिला सिर्फ एक के के हॉस्पिटल वाले ने सिर्फ फोन पिक किया था और लेकिन उन्होंने भी यही बोला कि सर हमारे पास बेड अवेलेबल नहीं है हमारे पास आईसीयू में जगह नहीं है हम आप एडमिट नहीं कर पाएंगे Angkor couldn't save his 63-year-old father. He believes that it wasn't the virus, but the callous and unresponsive system that took his father's life. उनको डर आ रहा था आँखों में। उनको लग रहा था क्या होगा? उसके बाद ये वो बोलते भी हैं कि आज सुबह आठ बजे तक मेरी रिपोर्ट आ जाएगी। हम लोग भी अब पढ़ रहे हैं ना तो कमा रहे हैं सब पढ़ रहे हैं लेकिन अपने पालना के लिए एक बेड एक ऑक्सीजन का इंतजाम तक नहीं कर पाए हमारे सामने उन्होंने दम तोड़ा हम कुछ नहीं कर पाए 
एक पेपर के लिए वैल्यू वैल्यू जिंदगी की वैल्यू नहीं है उनको कोरोना ने नहीं हमारे सिस्टम ने मार दिया अगर वो जिंदा एक बार बेड मिल जाता टाइमली तो बच जाते How will India survive this viral onslaught with its healthcare system in shambles? Not only Delhi, but also the country's commercial capital, Mumbai, has been ripped apart by the deadly virus, leaving doctors and healthcare workers reeling from burnout, unable to cope with thousands of deaths every day. India now bears witness to an unfolding tragedy that has laid bare the deep-rooted problems plaguing its public health system. What more horror awaits India now? Mumbai, India's commercial capital, is gasping for breath. The city that displayed remarkable resilience and fighting capacity during a terror attack in November 2008 is now fighting another grim battle. Only this time, it's fighting against an invisible enemy. COVID-19 has caused a severe strain on the already overburdened healthcare system, which is on the verge of collapse. Medical supplies have run critically short, while infections continue to surge. Doctors, nurses and hospital staff are at a breaking point, while healthcare provisions have been pushed to the limits. In April, an oxygen container leak choked 24 patients on ventilators to death. A fire in another hospital charred more than a dozen in a COVID ward. The state of Maharashtra, of which Mumbai is the capital, recorded the highest number of infections in April. It notched up more than 60,000 infections a day and over 30,000 deaths in the last four months. Even if you calculate only 10% of them will require hospitalization, that is a huge number of 40,000 plus on a daily basis, that, and there's a 14-day cycle to it if you get admitted, that you multiply it and it becomes like impossible to be able to be born by that medical infrastructure that we have in our country right now. So we were very happy that we dealt with the first wave and built up the infrastructure to a level that we thought that we were ready for COVID. But unfortunately with this, like I said, with the two factors of velocity and, and the volume with which it went, the numbers have overwhelmed everybody. Despite the grim scenario, selfless fighters on the front lines are not abandoning their posts at any cost. One of them is Dr. Tripti Gilada, an infectious diseases expert from Harvard, who is risking her life every day to bring people back from the edge. Her phone rings off the hook all day and night as she rushes to help one patient after another. Dr. Gilada admits that experts like her could not foresee the magnitude and intensity of the second wave at all. The present scenario of COVID-19 is absolutely catastrophic. We were really not expecting the second wave to be in such a big magnitude. Obviously speaking, none of us ever thought it would take us to these sheer numbers. The number of patients, the number of deaths, the number of households that are left absolutely devastated over the last few weeks is heart-wrenching. And it's a catastrophe not just for the country, it's a catastrophe for individual families and individual households and the community in total. For Dr. Gilada, treating a patient is the easier part. 
Dealing with frantic family members seeking hospital beds and oxygen is more traumatic. When we receive frantic calls from relatives, from friends, from people we've known probably for years or from people who we've met recently, and all that everyone is begging each other is for one ICU bed, one oxygen cylinder, some vials of injections, and that is very difficult. We tell all of them that Yes, we will try. Sometimes we are able to help them and sometimes we are not. And we know that out of the people who we are not able to help, we know over the next few days that some of them don't even make it. So it's just a heartbreaking story right now. When we step out of the hospital after the duty is over, you know, there are moments where we sit down and we feel that, you know, what could I have done more to save that family? But yeah, that's, that's I think, part of our profession and part of this pandemic. Far away from ground zero, many Singaporeans here are also spending sleepless nights. They don't know how to help their family members or friends back in India who might need emergency care. 40-year-old Singaporean Tasneem Nazrula is in touch with the parents in Mumbai every day. Tasneem, a risk and compliance manager in a leading financial company, is trying to keep her spirits up and not think of what will happen if there's an emergency. I think me and my sister are definitely worried. I mean, the biggest fear is if either one of them does contract COVID and we're unable to reach them in time, um, you know, because at the moment the variant is a strong one and they might have something in a couple of hours. My dad is an acute asthmatic um, patient and he's got borderline diabetes. So at the end of the day, I, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen. For now, Hosfa and Nafisa Nazrula have locked themselves up in their housing estate in Mumbai. They don't even dare to step out of their home at all. Groceries and essential items are delivered at their doorstep. But from Singapore, Tasneem cannot do much except pray. I even tried ordering oxygen cylinders online to see whether I could send it to them just in case to be, you know, have it on standby um, and be prepared. But I mean, that's all we can do at the moment. We can't really do anything from that perspective. Um, the worrying obviously is there on a regular basis, but that's all. The only thing we can do is be prepared at the moment. If anything does happen to them, they're going to rely on their network. They're going to rely on their friends. They're going to rely on their connections to try and get to a hospital. But there is a very real situation where they're unable to get the emergency help that they need. And, you know, they could just be at home and, and be in that position and, and they could pass away. So that, that's the biggest fear, obviously, at the moment for people who are separated, for families like us who are separated. The nightmare hasn't really happened overnight. It's a combination of decades of neglect, government apathy and sheer incompetence. Among the world's 25 largest emerging economies, India has the least number of hospital beds for 1,000 people. It's also close to the last few rungs in terms of doctors, nurses and midwives. The facilities in most government hospitals are abysmal, to say the least. Are having a shortage of oxygen because we did not ramp up our facilities in time uh, in fact, in the month of January, we were exporting oxygen to other countries in the world. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, we have to look upon this as a global problem. But the whole idea of a lockdown is to permit time to scale up the infrastructure. Uh, we did not do it in adequate time. A catastrophe on this scale would have pushed even the world's best healthcare facilities to their limits. But in India, it has simply ripped the system apart. Can India rebuild again? Can it flatten the second wave and emerge from the ashes of tens of thousands of funeral pyres lit across the nation?
major cities in India are being ravaged by the deadly virus at a frightening speed. Every few minutes, someone dies of COVID. The health system has collapsed, and so has India's self-belief. The federal and state governments are unable to tackle the worsening health crisis, save lives, or provide succor for the sick. But ordinary Indians are fighting back, reaffirming one's faith in humanity. From doctors, to health workers, to common people, all are risking their lives to defeat the viral onslaught. Fifty-two-year-old Rosie Saldana in Mumbai has been on dialysis for five years because of kidney failure. Rosie and her husband Pascal spent all their savings to set up basic medical facilities at home and kept an oxygen cylinder at hand in case of an emergency. Even as Rosie fights for her own life, she did not hesitate for a second to give away her sole oxygen cylinder to a teacher's husband who needed it. Teacher ka jo teacher hai, unka husband ko oxygen ki jarurat thi. Wo teacher ne bahut jage try kiya, kider ne principal ne bhi try kiya. Achhi achhi log ko bolao kal dekhenge, shaam ko dekhenge, isab bataye. To mujhe bolao please Pascal oxygen mil sakta hai kya? Mujhe bolao wife ne suna. Wife bolta hai ek kam kar, kisko oxygen chahiye? Mujhe bolao school ka teacher foreign leke ja. और दे दे तो मेरी जान का परवाह नहीं करना मैं एकदम फिट हूँ ये ऑक्सीजन जिसको लगता है वो भी टीचर है मैं भी टीचर थे तो वो ऑक्सीजन जाके उनको दे दो मुझे कुछ नहीं होएगा अब ये लेके जाओ ऑक्सीजन और उसको लगा दो तो वो ऑक्सीजन जाके मैं उसको वहाँ लगा दे दिस एंटायर सागा ऑफ अक्यूट शॉर्टेज ऑफ हॉस्पिटल बेड्स अक्यूट शॉर्टेज ऑफ इंटेंसिव केयर बेड्स acute shortage of oxygen beds is extremely challenging to handle you know as doctors we've been trained we are always used to being able to help whoever comes to us and uh, it's heartbreaking because now how much ever we would want to help people we are just limited by the resources and the resources are as basic as, as oxygen Rosie has now sold all her jewellery and bought oxygen cylinders to help others in Mumbai. She wants to save as many lives as possible. After that, I came to my house. After that, I told my wife, what did I say? Do a job. There is a lot of oxygen. A lot of people are dying. Where is the oxygen? I am giving my money. I am giving my money. I am giving my money. जो भी पैसा आता है उसको ऑक्सीजन ले लो ये मैं दे रही हूँ मतलब मेरे तरफ से दे रही हूँ तो मैंने बोला ठीक है उस दिन क्या किया मैं वो गहने लेके गया अस्सी हजार रुपये मुझे मिला वो अस्सी हजार रुपये में मैंने जाके ऑक्सीजन लेके आके स्टार्ट किया रोजी सल्दाना इज नॉट अ लोन इन हर सेल्फलेस सर्विस फॉर द सिक एंड द डाइंग Many like her are taking care of helpless patients who have been turned away by hospitals across the country. In Delhi, a Sikh voluntary organization has stepped in to fill the void left by the struggling healthcare system. The group has set up makeshift hospital facilities at several locations across the city, giving a breath of life to many COVID patients. सर हेल्थ सिस्टम दस हुआ तभी यहाँ पे लोगों का तादाद लगा हुआ था कोई किसी को भी अटेंड करने का राजी नहीं कोई हॉस्पिटल के बेड खाली नहीं जो बिचारा ऑटो पे या रिक्शे पे आ रहा उसको हॉस्पिटल के बाहर तक भी नहीं खड़ा होने देते थे उनको हमने बेडों पे लाके ऑक्सीजन देके उनको जीवनदान दिया सर अमीरों के पास जहाँ मर्सिडीज भी खड़ी है यहाँ रिक्शा भी खड़ा है पर जिसको प्रायरिटी थी हमने रिक्शे वाले की अगर डाउन लेवल पर जा रही ऑक्सीजन उसको उठा के हमने ऑक्सीजन दी हमने ना तो लेवल देखा ना कोई कॉम ना कोई हमने ये देखा कोई हिंदू है मुस्लिम सिख हमारे लिए सब बराबर हैं the free service is run voluntarily by doctors and health workers. 
If a patient becomes critical, he is then sent to a hospital. But most of the patients are stabilized at the outdoor facility and don't need hospital care. Gurpreet says they have so far treated thousands of patients and have not refused a single one. Time नहीं है कि हम आपको attend नहीं कर सकते। एक भी not a single person, करीब पंद्रह हजार आदमी यहाँ पे आए, जिसमें आठ से दस हजार उस situation पे थे, उनको दो मिनट या पांच मिनट भी अगर oxygen late होती, तो उनके साथ कुछ भी हो सकता था। इस करके यहाँ गुरु के घर free सेवा थी, हम किसी को मना नहीं किया। the federal and state governments have finally been jolted into action. They are now fighting with their backs to the wall. There's now a complete to partial lockdown in most of the states and union territories. Even the local authorities are serious about imposing lockdowns, not hesitating to spare the rod in case of violators. But experts think, ultimately, it must be the vaccination program that has to be ramped up on a massive scale to win this war. The other day, a TV journalist wanting a quick bite asked me that, can you quickly tell us what are the three things that India needs to do the most today to get the second wave under control? And uh, it didn't take me a second. I said the three things are, one, vaccinate, two, vaccinate, and three, vaccinate. We need to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. Uh, that's a process which is now underway because vaccination is getting decentralized. It is opening up to all the uh, demographic uh, parameters, all the demographic uh, stages. And uh, we're also going to get vaccination from abroad. So it's a move in the right step. Uh, trifle late, but nonetheless in the right step. And that's the first thing we need to do. But vaccination levels fell by more than 50% in the first week of May from a month earlier. This happened even as the federal government expanded the drive by allowing all adults above 18 years to get inoculated. India has already vaccinated 187 million people which is around 14% of the population. Out of this, only 3% are fully vaccinated. We, we saw those effects in the second wave. And if we really have to keep ourselves from a very disastrous third wave, we will have to vaccinate a substantial number of our population at a phenomenal speed. And no, we do not have enough vaccines and we will have to really focus a lot of our attention to making sure that we have enough vaccines in the first place and secondly making sure that we ramp up the entire vaccination drive so that we are able to vaccinate people not just in cities but down to every village level. Meanwhile, issues of oxygen shortage and other bottlenecks in the healthcare infrastructure are being ironed out by a panel of experts set up by the Supreme Court. Green oxygen corridors have been created to transport medical oxygen at high speed from one state to another. In the last few days, the hospital bed crisis has eased a little because of the emergency steps taken by all state governments on a war footing. Still, experts think it will take a while before the pandemic curve starts to flatten. We will start seeing the case counts beginning to fall, daily case counts. But it's not going to be uniform across the country. Some places will have earlier fall, some places will have a late fall. But all this is contingent on the fact that at least from now, we do the right things with the right speed. Towards the beginning of June, we may see the numbers coming down because there are two parts to it. When it's raging in the hinterland, it becomes even more difficult to report because there are, there are, they are so widespread that it's difficult to assess what's going on. But this wave is not going away through May. And I think hopefully in June, we will see the downturn. The second COVID wave has turned India into a deserted battlefield, littered with the dead and the dying. The scenes are reminiscent of dark ages in the distant past. 
bodies littering the streets. Funeral pyres burning bright. When Prime Minister Narendra Modi assumed office in 2014, he kindled dreams of a new India among millions of ordinary citizens. The dreams have now turned to ashes. The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Washington says India will account for almost 1.2 million deaths by September this year. For now, India can only hope and pray that this dire prediction never comes true. It is in the nature of viral pandemics across 10,000 years of documented human history that they come and they go. They undoubtedly leave a lot of devastation in their way, as has the current pandemic. But at the end of the day, they recede. That is no consolation to the people who are ill, to the people who are grieving for the one loved ones they have lost. There's a sense of hopelessness in the country, a belief that the government has not done enough to avert a disaster of this magnitude or alleviate the sufferings of ordinary citizens. Many feel they're left to fend for themselves and fight a vicious pandemic on their own. Pandemic will run its natural course. This particular wave of COVID will subside. Give it two months, case numbers will come down. But the real tragedy is that they're not coming down because of any kind of concerted effort or action. They're just coming down because they've gone around, been around, infected people, people have died. We're sort of living uh, in the jungle where this is how it works. So I think all kinds of civilizational efforts have truly, truly ceased. And we are just, you know, waiting for praying to God or whatever higher power to guide us because collectively there's nothing being done to really control. Every day in the ward or the ICU is like a battle, you know, and every day we see victories and we see losses. I did lose two of my patients today. It's, it's heartbreaking. 